We know that this fight for health equity is far from new. Um, it's the reason I got into this work and to health policy work, being from uh, rural Eastern North Carolina and seeing these issues firsthand. Um, but we know that there's been a longstanding history of discrimination and bias in the healthcare system and the effects of stress and trauma that we see on black communities um, as a result of systemic racism in our country. And also just the fact that brown and black people still continue to have high rates of being uninsured in our country and in our state. But the COVID-19 pandemic brought even more new attention to these issues. We know that looking at the data on COVID-19, black people in this country are dying at one and a half times the rate of white people. And black and Latinx Americans are four times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19 than white Americans. And with these issues really on the forefront right now, we wanna discuss how we can really be on time and respond to these issues, urgent issues, and discuss why and how Georgia can prioritize health equity as we move forward with our healthcare and public health solutions during the pandemic response and beyond. And joining me today, I'm excited to introduce uh, Dr. James Eddie Black. He is the Director of Emergency Medical Services at Phoebe Putney Health System in Albany, Georgia. Also, I'm joined by Rachel Stinklin, who is the Georgia Outreach Manager at Small Business Majority, and Dr. Sarah Vinson, who is a triple board certified forensic psychiatrist and founder and principal consultant at L'Oreal Psych Group. So thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. I'll start with some questions for each of our panelists. Um, and also I'm curious to hear from you all, what does health equity mean for you? So I'll leave it open in the chat. I was gonna do a poll, but there's so many different um, ways that health equity um, shows up and what it means to each of us. So feel free to type those in the chat. Uh, look, love to see your thoughts and also feel free to submit questions for our panel. We'll try to have some time at the end for some questions and you can submit those in the Q&A function on Zoom along the way. So first I'll have a question for Dr. Black. So with rural hospital closures and high rates of uninsured across the state, access to healthcare was already a challenge in many parts of Southwest Georgia where you live and work. Um, but then we saw COVID-19, the pandemic hit that area so hard being one of the first spots in the state to be a hotspot. Uh, so can you tell us about healthcare in your community before, during the pandemic and what you learned from the COVID response? Uh, good morning, and thank you. Uh, you know, our hospital, uh, Phoebe Putney Rural Hospital, services a great portion of the southwest corner, southwest corner of the state. And there's not uh, another hospital of our size within 90 miles of us. So we provide a lot of the tertiary care for the this part of the state. That being said, uh, there's still a great portion uh, of the surrounding areas that feel like they don't have access. And it's not just enough to say that a hospital exists and that the emergency department will always see you. But having that access also entails transportation to trust in and, uh, and other factors. So, uh, you know, whenever you start talking about access to healthcare or, or um, uh, the disproportionate or the inequitabilities of access to healthcare, you have to understand those barriers that will present to some, some people. And, and there's good reason for some of that, um, I guess, lack of accessing. And some of it is born out of historical reference and those are well documented, but ongoing um, biases that we see in the community. So we first have to uh, acknowledge and address it in order to overcome it. And I think for a long time, people have not been willing to discuss that. So, um, you know, you couple that with when coronavirus hit and it hit us in uh, late March, uh, uh, excuse me, at, at March, April and May. Um, and at one point in time, we were fourth in the world as far as the death rate from coronavirus behind Wuhan, China, the Lombardy region in Italy and New York City. And uh, it was new and frightening to everyone. And so while we're trying to combat a lot of dis and misinformation that was being presented to people uh, through various outlets, some on social media and some on even what we consider traditional media, you know, when you're trying to get the message out to people, you first have to overcome um, that trust barrier for a lot of people that we haven't addressed adequately in the past. So uh, those are some of our challenges that we had. And, um, it, you know, it started with being very transparent, being very open and honest about our missteps in the past as a uh, from a healthcare perspective, and then um, also trying to do what you can to inform and educate the public and um, ask for their assistance, but also garnering their trust and helping to take care of the healthcare needs. And how are you working around addressing some of the mistrust that you're seeing, and especially with the vaccine rollout and distribution? What is that looking like for you all? 
Um, very good. And that's, that's the ongoing issue now. And again, you know, it's hard for us to um, react as fast as social media will act, but um, we're doing what we can. And I think we've pledged to uh, be involved in any um, avenue we can as far as to get information out. So we are still holding as a community weekly press conferences um, involving the civic leaders, our pre-hospital personnel, hospital health department, and we answer various questions that are being posed then. But also we've availed ourselves to any group that wish to have someone from the medical community come and speak to them from our standpoint uh, concerning vaccines, vaccine safety, efficacy, and then answering questions that people are posing. And um, I just uh, yesterday, I guess I was grabbed to go down and talk to the hospital EBS um, staff who at our hospital had a very low vaccination rate. And um, one of them said, you know, we just like to ask some questions. So they, they grabbed me and I went down for the huddle and asked questions. And um, they had very good questions, mind you. They've been doing their research. So they just wanted some questions answered before they were wanting to do that. But it, it takes us being open, uh, being honest addressing things such as the excuse me, Tuskegee experiment, which seems to be on everybody's mind and everybody's saying, well, you know, I just don't trust this. And so you have to first lay out the realities of how many people are suffering and dying from this disease every day and the potential ability of the vaccine to curb that infection rate and thereby reduce the amount of deaths. So uh, it takes a lot of conscious effort uh, for us to get the information out. And, and we have to be very intentional about it but again, I'll be willing to do that for the community. Thank you. And just kind of one more follow up around that as far as people who are seeking treatment or seeking access to health care. Are you seeing more people losing coverage or having difficulty paying or how are the federal resources also supporting your hospital to account for some of those issues as well? Uh, well, in a very good question, you know, we're not not for profit hospital and we have had a history of taking care of a large segment of people who are under or uninsured. And uh, that number that gap appears to be widening as healthcare resources and uh, healthcare insurance uh, appears to be waning in the amount of things that they cover. Uh, so again, um, getting out in the community and, and reassuring them that we're going to take care of you. Uh, we, you know, gotten some relief from the federal government in the form of the CARES Act, but you may be aware that a lot of that money that was earmarked, they came back and kind of changed the rules about what we could use it for. So a lot of people were called, uh, I guess, unprepared for the fact that the money that they intended to use the CARES Act for could, not, could no longer be used. But we try not to, and we have not let that affect how we're taking care of the community. And so we, um, you know, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, with respect to access, we have to go out into the community and we put um, emphasis on going out into the community instead of waiting for the community to come to us because it may not be possible. And you mentioned hospital closures, one of the hospitals within 40 minutes of us, uh, that was a combined hospital, nursing home and emergency department, they had to uh, stop their acute care services for financial reasons. So only the nursing home still exists. So um, not only was it a large employer, but it's also a source of healthcare coverage for the community. So as those things waver and, and disappear, uh, we, we have to step up and, and be willing to do what it takes to get people to access healthcare. Thank you, that was great. I think that really gave us some good insight on the current vaccine rollout and, and thoughts and, and also the ties between health and economics. As, as you said, it's the, a large employer in a lot of communities, the healthcare system. Uh, so I'll turn to Dr. Vinson now with uh, some questions about just Georgia's investments in mental health. I know that the state has invested a lot of money in mental health and substance abuse treatment in recent years, largely due to a settlement with the federal government around requiring um, people to move out of institutions and into communities to receive care. Uh, but because of the pandemic, we also are seeing even more demand for mental health services and hearing a lot about that. So can you tell us a little bit about why that is and who's the most affected? Absolutely, and thank you for addressing mental health as a part of it because it's often overlooked. Um, but as a psychiatrist, there's a very real appreciation I have for how mental health affects everything. Um, with the settlement and some of the money that was allocated because of it, it really was focused on adults uh, because that's what the lawsuit was focused on. And so what we saw is that that money wasn't getting to children and adolescents um, or for services for them. So even though there was some money being allocated um, as a whole, our state was still very low out of the 50 states in per capita mental health funding. And then as a percentage of that that went to kids, it was lower than, than that. Um, and what we've seen with COVID is that it's a time when people need more help, more resources, more ways to cope because of the stress, not only of the illness itself, but also the ripple effects of it on school, 
education, people's financial standing, um, and the groups that were already vulnerable because of historic inequities, current inequities, current discrimination um, have taken a bigger hit on all of those education, employment, health fronts as well. And so you have more stress and less ways to adaptively deal with that stress. And so people who never have had mental health problems before are having them now. People who had them before may be having more severe symptoms. Uh, so it's a time when our state is in need of more supports, not just in terms of mental health care, but in terms of addressing those social determinants of health, like where people live, work, play, and also basic necessities, like making sure that people have enough food to eat. That's great. Thank you. And also just um, some more, what are some of the ways I know that you've been working with Georgia's uh, Behavioral Health Commission um, in the legislature on some ideas? I know they haven't released the recommendations yet, but what are some th issues that you looked at as far as responses that are successful or solutions that you are considering as far as responding to children's behavioral health issues specifically or more broadly um, and targeted efforts that are focused on equity as well? Yeah, so one of the things that we have to think about with equity in Georgia has uh, to do not only with race, but also with the urban rural divide, right? So, uh, so many of our counties in Georgia are rural counties um, and there's a child psychiatry shortage period, but once you get into certain areas of the state, uh, that is magnified. And so with the child subcommittee, we really looked at recommendations that would be able to serve rural Georgia as, as well. Uh, so things like working with primary care providers who may already be in those counties um, and also working with school-based health centers and uh, through the APEX program. And so the APEX program, can you talk a little bit more about that and uh, how that is rolling out and um, the plans to build on that and successes that y'all may have seen thus far? Yeah, so with the APEX program, it's been nice because it takes advantage of the fact that schools are local and that they're in every community um, and creates and supports partnerships between schools and mental health providers. Um, and so what we hope to see happen uh, is that the state uh, continues to provide support for it and actually provide support for, an, for it at an even higher level. Um, understanding that as these kids transition back to school, many of them are going to be behind academically. Many of them have had stressful situations happen in their homes and in their communities. Um, and it's going to be a perfect storm for frustration and acting out and externalizing behaviors um, that people may be tempted to respond to punitively, but are really signs of the mental distress um, and the limited coping that kids are under right now. Um, and so I think that program is going to be really important to support um, as kids are transitioning back. Thank you, that's great. Um, so I think that provides us some good context uh, for some Q&A and as we talk about solutions towards the end of this uh, panel, we can get back to that as one promising solution law lawmakers can consider. Um, but I'll now I'll turn to Rachel to talk a little bit about your unique perspective that you bring uh, from small businesses in Georgia and seeking to strengthen the healthcare system, especially because small business owners often see so many inequities in healthcare coverage and their employees as well. Um, and we know that small businesses in Georgia are very diverse. So we have one of the stop, top states uh, for growth in women-owned businesses. And this is largely driven by businesses owned by women of color. Um, so can you tell us just a little bit about some of the healthcare issues affecting small businesses and how some of those policies in healthcare and maybe other areas as well that you're advocating for can address the equity challenges we're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Laura. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Shanklin, and I'm the Georgia Outreach Manager for Small Business Majority. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to share a few slides with some statistics um, just about small businesses as well as healthcare. Let's see. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Awesome. So Small Business Majority is a national small business advocacy organization. And we really focus on those businesses that are often underrepresented. Um, like Lara said, you know, women entrepreneurs, um, black owned businesses, entrepreneurs of color, Latinx businesses. Um, and we really advocate for equitable policies that, you know, support and encourage these more diverse um, small businesses. And we know that black owned businesses and entrepreneurs of color 
confront obstacles that white owned businesses do not, um, especially support services and benefits like retirement and healthcare. So that being said, these problems have been extremely highlighted by the current movement for racial equality. Um, and we see that the COVID-19 pandemic has um, disproportionately affected these businesses, not only through a healthcare lens, but also through an economic lens. Um, not to mention the small businesses that have been forced to lay off staff. Um, when you lay off staff, you know, that is loss of health coverage. So when we take into account the unemployment rates, we also need to take into account those that have lost health coverage. Um, I think the SBA mentioned it was 26, 208,000 jobs um, in Georgia. So access to affordable health care has been historically unequal in communities of color and for their small businesses, which correlates with local disparities. Um, as Laura mentioned, there are over 500,000 women-owned businesses in Georgia alone. Um, as you can see on the statistics here, we a lot of the small businesses that we represent are sole proprietors, self-employed, often those businesses that may not have access to um, those premiums that they can afford. Um, small business owners rely on health care for their employees as well as themselves and their families. So it's important to um, take into account how they have been disproportionately affected by the, um, the COVID-19 COVID pandemic. Um, and I'd also like to mention that some of these stats right here, a lot of these small business owners, we pulled, um, we have 80,000 small businesses nationally in our, in our network and 41% of black and Latino owned businesses mentioned that they will not through a survey be able to make it through the next few months without financial support. Um, our scientific polling regularly finds that small businesses rank healthcare as the top challenge that they face, especially those businesses in rural communities which we've also seen have been disproportionately affected. Um, so if we see these numbers and who own these small businesses and we know what they're doing for our state's economy, we see the revenue that they're bringing in, why are these folks being disproportionately affected? Um, I think it's really important for Georgia to recognize the impact of the intersection of health care and workforce. If we don't have healthy a healthy workforce, we're not going to have a healthy economy. Um, but with that, Laura, I will hand it back over to you unless you have further questions. Thank you. That was great. I think we have quite a few questions in the chat, so I can start getting to some of those. Um, I guess actually one for you, Rachel, while we're on the topic of uh, entrepreneurs and uh, this question is more about freelancers and contractors and gig workers, but for your uh, for question for you, can you talk about gig workers, freelancers, contractors, and protections to help ensure health insurance is available as Georgia moves forward to implement healthcare waivers and possibly prohibiting people from cover purchasing coverage through the ACA platform. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first and foremost, I'll say Medicaid expansion, Medicaid expansion. Like that's my my biggest um, my biggest go to because so many small business owners, especially in Georgia, fall into that coverage gap. Many of them are self employed. Many are sole proprietors. Um, so they one don't if they do have employee sponsored insurance, it might be through the individual marketplace. And we see what happened with the 1332 waiver and how healthcare.gov is going to be taken away. So two things need to happen. One, Georgia needs to expand the Medicaid program. This is gonna create 56,000 jobs. It's gonna bring in 6.5 billion annually. The rural hospitals will hopefully be brought back. The one that Dr. Black was speaking of, you know, restoring those jobs um, and not to mention protecting those consumers from surprise billing and guaranteeing um, health protections for those with pre-existing conditions. Additionally, what can happen, um, what needs to happen is the state of Georgia needs to overturn the 1332 waiver to ensure that those business owners and their employees can obtain affordable health coverage without worrying about being waitlisted for health care um, should the state reach a limit in providing financial assistance. But my answer would be Medicaid expansion and, you know, hopefully that could happen soon. <laughs> That leads to another question. I saw you, Dr. Black, shaking your head around Medicaid expansion too. So there's a question for you around that issue. Um, if Medicaid was expanded in Georgia, what do you think the impact would be for on your hospital during COVID? And you can also maybe speak broadly to that too. 
it would actually make all the difference in the world, you know, and uh, someone asked for statistics about the rising number of uninsured and the impact on uh, on, the impact on hospitals. I can't give you those actual statistics, but in talking with our uh, CFO and others, where we, you know, talk about the financial status of the hospital, Medicaid expansion uh, would mean the world of difference for those hospitals like ours that are not for profit and also work in those areas where there's a high amount of uh, under, under and uninsured people, as well as we have a, down in Southwest Georgia, a large migrant population that's probably underrepresented from a number standpoint. And that was actually born out a few years ago when we had uh, multiple tornadoes that hit the section of the state and our city. And we set up clinics away from the hospital and the amount of people that were showing up because they were afraid to go to a, a formal healthcare facility for a variety of reasons, as you might imagine, but we're actually seeking healthcare. So there's a large amount of people who would benefit from health care and also who will probably not delay seeking care, uh, which also leads to further instances of uh, morbidity, morbidity and mortality in the um, people of color. That's a great point. I think that, you know, there's also some questions about efforts around the full Medicaid expansion from the state legislature. So I can jump in on that. Uh, we're tracking that and we'll keep you all updated. But currently the governor is planning on only doing a partial Medicaid expansion. It would only cover people making below the poverty line, slightly less than a full Medicaid expansion would, but the biggest catch and issue with it is that it would really limit the amount of people who could get covered because it requires you to pay a premium and also to report every single month that you're working 80 hours a month. Um, and we've seen in other states that that has had a, a big effect on decreasing enrollment over time and um, it just really makes an additional burden and uh, has caused a lot of issues and also been challenged legally in other states. So we're still waiting on to see if this will actually be implemented. It's set to be July 1st that we'll start to see people getting covered. And as of now, the state is estimating only about 30,000 people will get covered in the first year. And that is compared to almost half a million people that we could have covered this year with Medicaid expansion. So that's kind of where we are now is keeping an eye on the waiver and ways to continue to push for full Medicaid expansion from the coverage standpoint, as far as covering so many more people than 30,000 and also getting a bigger return on the investment. As far as just we get a, a higher federal match for the full Medicaid expansion versus paying more and covering very few people because we only get a regular Medicaid match with the proposed waiver. So. Uh, finish that question. Um, but for Dr. Vincent, there's some questions about and some conversation I think happening around, you know, having healthcare coverage is really important, um, but we also have to think about the workforce, are people there to serve folks with coverage if they're getting new coverage? Um, so a question is about some mental health equity issues around the shortage of culturally competent care for Georgia's a million plus refugees and immigrants. Um, today, one in 10 Georgians is foreign born and the number is rising. Yet three, there are very few mental health providers that offer affordable, culturally and linguistically appropriate care. So the question is, how can we develop the workforce we need and sustain the providers already offering this care? Sure, and that's a really uh, great and important question. Um, and it does come back in part to sort of what we're willing to put resources into as a community and as a state. So if you have the workforce, they still have to work within the system that we're provided. Um, and so the system has to be adequately funded to have things like uh, interpretation services um, and things like that. And at this point, um, it's difficult sometimes to even cover the cost of basic services, let alone some of those things that we need in order to serve everybody well. Um, so that's a piece of it. Um, the other thing I think that we should look at and consider is our pipeline and how we uh, train and who we recruit and support through that process. Um, and so programs that oversample from underserved communities like immigrant com communities or racial, ethnic minority communities or rural communities. Um, if you have people who have personal ties and lived experiences with those underserved groups, those people are more likely uh, to understand their experiences because they've had them themselves. And they're also more likely to go back and want to serve in those communities. Um, and so thinking about ways to um, create pipeline programs starting as early as high school so that 
so that those uh, kids who become adults, who become professionals, um, are able to see themselves working in that capacity. Thank you. Um, we also have a question for Dr. Black about really responding to the hesitancy, as we talked a little bit about in your intro, the mistrust that can be seen around the vaccine. Uh, the question is, what have you found to be the most effective strategy for addressing the hesitancy you described among residents receiving the COVID vaccine? And what can public health agencies, if you all have partnered with public health agencies, what can they do as well to help address these issues? Uh, well, a very good question. And, and it's an ongoing struggle, but I think the the things that we need to consider, number one, are transparency. Um, you know, you can't have really trust without transparency, or you can't expect people to uh, trust you without being transparent for the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then availability is one of my big pushes to make sure that we have uh, people involved in healthcare who are willing to go out to the communities. And right now, our uh, civic leaders are setting up a forum for a lot of our um, church leaders to actually meet with me and some other positions just to answer questions that they can take back to their congregations. And they're gonna bring forward those questions. And then accountability for everything that's going on. I think, again, we have to uh, acknowledge what has happened in the past, why uh, we refuse to let those uh, missteps and biases and inequities, where we refuse to let those happen again, but also share our own experiences. And um, as I like to tell people, I don't wanna tell anyone to get the vaccine, but I will tell you that I, I encourage my mother uh, who's the person I love this most in the world to get the vaccine. So that's my biggest endorsement. So I think, you know, by our, our actions, uh, we have to develop a trust you know, to repair the separate trust that we have with the public and also so they trust enough to trust us enough to give them um, relevant and accurate information so that they can make their own decisions. But certainly, as we have done that, we've seen the numbers in the people uh, who were formerly hesitant to get the vaccine are actually agreeing to get it once they have that interaction. And a lot of people, again, you go back to access to medicine. There are a great amount of people, uh, a large percentage of people who don't feel like they can have those questions answered. Even if they have a primary care doctor, they say, well, you know, I can't get them on the phone. I can't get those questions answered. So I think it's incumbent upon us to be available uh, for those types of information sharing sessions. Thank you. That's great information. Um, we also still have some back to a little bit on Medicaid expansion and just kind of delving into that issue a little bit more as far as lessons that we can learn from Medicaid expansion as it relates to racial equity, as far as thinking about how this policy, even though it would be providing coverage to a lot of people, what is really the benefit to racial equity of providing health coverage and, and how do we um, amplify its impact on racial equity and possibly with other policy choices like addressing social determinants of health and, and what those solutions could be as well. And that could maybe be for each of you. So sure, so, so we know that um, racial minorities are more likely to be uninsured. And so avenues that open up for insurance um, are really helpful. The other thing that we've seen in dramatic form in this uh, pandemic as well is uh, segregation by employment, right? So not only are they more likely to be uninsured, they're more likely to work in jobs that may not come with health insurance, uh, paid time off, uh, sick days, things like that. And so Medicaid expansion can help in those ways too. Um, what we've seen with uh, this past year, something that we knew already, uh, but that a system that is dependent on employers uh, to provide insurance that doesn't have a universal sort of net underneath it is one that is very vulnerable to fluctuations in, in job markets. Um, and with all of the job loss that we saw happen this past year, Black people, Brown people, and Asian people were more likely to lose their jobs. Uh, so if they had employer-based health insurance, they're more likely to use, lose their health insurance. So it was an issue before uh, 2020, but it's an even greater issue now. I'll mention from the small business side, especially when we're talking about Georgia and the 500,000 plus women owned firms in Georgia. Um, you know, we have to ensure not only with Medicaid, but we have to ensure access to health care for those women for health care and birth control. Um, we know in Georgia that black women have the highest maternal mortality rates and they have the least access to health care. Um, you know, our polling shows that women of color who have their own businesses adamantly support and strongly support um, 
Medicaid expansion as they grow their businesses because it gives them access uh, to, you know, benefits otherwise they would not have. And I echo what they have said about the uh, Medicaid expansion. One of the other things I wanted to add on to those uh, determinants of people who are, have suffered, and in particular with COVID, is that a lot of the minorities uh, have forward-facing jobs and they didn't have the luxury of working for home, from home with the computer, uh, let alone a lot of people need to have internet access or computers. So those things have magnified a disease, uh, a pandemic such as COVID has magnified those inequities that have always existed. And uh, I firmly believe that history is going to look back on this, uh, not so much as how we responded, but what did we change afterwards? We, we've always talked about those inequities in medicine, and it's a recurring topic. And then kind of everybody's just accepted, well, it is what it is. But we have to no longer take that approach, and we have to refuse to accept it as it is what it is. And I think Medicaid expansion is the first in a lot of steps that we can make. Um, if you provide, you know, that, that one stratifier for everything else is someone's health. And uh, no matter your station in life or your income, when your health fails, we're all kind of on the same playing field, with the exception of those with health care are, are less reluctant to access it, and those without it are reluctant to access health care, resulting in greater rates of mortality and morbidity. So we have to address it. We can no longer just accept it as, as being the norm. Absolutely. Uh, that's really important, just the role of health coverage and also just people's attitudes and ability to seek care and also seeking care earlier on instead of waiting until conditions are so much more worse um, and, and costly for the system, but also just worse for individuals who are now dealing with um, more serious health effects. So I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, one question um, around, I think it's addressing mental health parity. So for Dr. Vincent, um, the question is really around just the fact that a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists may not accept insurance and um, you have to pay through uh, cash or check and or they may be out of network or ins private insurance issues broadly around mental health. So insurance companies often sometimes will even bill behavioral health differently. Um, or in the wrong way uh, than physical health services. So I know mental health parity is a discussion. Can you talk a little bit about that issue and, and ways to kind of regulate private insurance in addition to Medicaid um, to better respond and pay for mental health services? So equity is um, on the books, uh, but it's not necessarily in clinics or in hospitals or in communities, right? Um, so we still have to work on enforcement um, and we still have to work on um, building a system that actually works in a way that supports parity. It's, it's, really, um, it's really hard for one law to turn around a system that has been built in such a way um, that it has been consistently and systematically um, inequitable when it comes to mental health care provision. Um, and so it really is going to take an investment from regulators, um, from payers, um, from the employers who are partnering with private insurers to hold them accountable, from the state uh, to hold Medicaid and manage Medicaid's accountable um, in order to enforce parity. Because without that happening, uh, we're gonna have the law that's still not being uh, significantly enforced. Um, one thing that I, I will point out and make sure that everybody's aware of is that we do have uh, community service boards throughout the state um, that are sort of your safety net mental health care providers. Unfortunately, some of them do not provide children's mental health services. And so children really are left in a gap often. Um, and so that's why with the child subcommittee recommendations on the commission, we really thought about integrated care and supporting our primary care doctors, understanding that's who we have now. Um, but that enforcement, that accountability um, from employers and from the state is going to be critical. Thank you. And thank you all for covering such a broad range of issues from Medicaid to mental health services, to hospitals, to entrepreneurs and their challenges. I think this was really great. For, discussion for us to continue as far as we look at solutions during the legislative session and beyond to respond to and really target health equity. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Vincent. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Dr. Black for joining us. We are out of time, uh, but we are very glad that you all had such great questions and we hope to continue the chat in cadence and uh, continue this conversation in the years to come. So thank you all so much.